Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I'm so happy to see you. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy you found me. And if you've been here before, I love you so much. Thanks for coming back and I can't wait to hang out with you today. I'm just going to warn you up front, this is going to be a really long one today. I made a decision to redo the first four videos that I put out because honestly, I watch them now and I cringe. I'm not saying my videos now are great, but they're a whole hell of a lot better than they used to be. My dumbass decided to do the top guys in my first ever episodes, which means the worst videos that I made were also the most important guys, so I'm redoing them. I hope you stick around and watch, so go grab your popcorn, grab your drinks, and let's get started. John Joseph Gotti Jr. was born on October 27th, 1940. He was born in the Bronx to John Gotti Sr. and Philoma DiCarlo. He was one of 13 children, so there was a lot of children. His father worked as a day laborer, and his mom was a stay-at-home mom. They were really, really poor. John would show up to school in mismatched shoes, and he got bullied a lot as a kid. His family moved to East New York and settled in Brooklyn when he was 12 years old. This is when he got involved with a street gang. He got involved at a super young age, which is not great. <laughs> He had a history of truancy and bullying other students at school until he dropped out at the age of 16 years old. So not a great childhood. That's not a very good upbringing. While Gotti was growing up, he found a mentor, Carmine Fatigo. Fatigo had him running errands, getting dry cleaning, all that good stuff, while Fatigo himself was rising through the ranks of the Gambino family. When he was 14 years old, Gotti was trying to steal a cement mixer and it fell on his foot. This injury led Gotti to having a limp for the rest of his life. Gotti started the Fulton Rockaway gang, which is... You guessed it, on the corner of Fulton and Rockaway in Brooklyn. This is where he met Angelo Ruggiero and Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson. He met Victoria DiGiorgio at a bar, and he married her four years later. In 1962, he worked in a coat factory and as an assistant truck driver. He really wanted to work legitimately, but that didn't happen. He was arrested and put in jail twice before he just gave that up altogether and was like, nah, the life of crime is the life for me. I give up. In 1962, he got a draft notice, and he said, fuck that shit. I'm not going anywhere. He went nowhere. In 1963, he was arrested for failing to report for induction into the army. While the Selective Service was searching for him, they found out that Gotti and his parents weren't talking. They, they had some serious beef. His parents said that they hadn't seen him in a long time. The draft notices that were being sent were being sent to his parents' house. But his parents are saying that they haven't seen him in a year. He was arrested for grand larceny, which is how the Selective Service was finally able to catch up with him. And when they got their hands on him, he said that he didn't realize that he was supposed to serve because he had two kids and he also had a criminal record. He was tried for failure to report, but when he made the argument that he didn't know that he was supposed to report, the judge believed him. He was found not guilty, but he was ordered to report for Army service in 1965. When he went to report for Army service, the army didn't have his paperwork. He noped the fuck out of there and he never turned back. He was free to go and he never served in the army. Patty got married to Victoria on March 6th, 1962. They had five kids together. Their names were John Gotti III, Victoria, Frank, Peter Gotti Jr., and Angel. Over the years, Gotti's been arrested a shit ton of times for stupid little things. The street racing, getting into fights, all of that, everything stupid kids do that get in trouble a lot. In 1968, him, his brother Gene, and Rogerio were arrested for committing three cargo thefts and truck hijacks near JFK Airport. He was caught because the employees at the United Airlines identified him as the dude that had signed for the stolen merchandise. So this dumbass came face to face with people and was saying that it was his cargo and stealing it. He was arrested again after a third hijacking of $50,000 worth of cigarettes. He pulled off this theft while he was on bail from the first two charges. He was found guilty from these crimes and he was sentenced to three years in jail. When he got out, he went back to his crew at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, which was known as the Bergen Crew. He was put in charge of the crew's gambling operations by Carmine Fatico, even though he wasn't even a made man yet. This is pretty notable, because in order to run any part of any crew, 
you're supposed to be a made member. He's not even a street soldier at this point. He's just an associate because he's not officially part of the mafia. So Fatiko allowing him to run the crew's gambling operations, that's a pretty huge deal to allow someone who isn't even an official member to run any part of any operation. So this is a pretty big deal. During this time, Gotti had been going to report all of the crew's earnings and activities to Aniello Della Croce, the underboss of the Gambino family, and he started to form a pretty strong relationship with him. Della Croce is a douche. Whenever anybody brings Della Croce up, I love to tell this story because I just think it speaks a lot to his character. There was a stray German shepherd that used to sleep on the steps of the Ravenite Social Club. That's where Della Croce's crew was operating. The FBI disclosed that when Della Croce was having a bad day, he would come out the door and kick this poor German shepherd that was just sleeping and minding his business. I'm the biggest animal person in the world, I swear. I'm like that white girl that would pet a bear if it got close enough. Anything floofy gets pets. So when I hear things like this, like a dude abusing a poor animal that's just minding his business and sleeping, he already has such a hard life living on the streets in New York City as a stray dog. I absolutely despise that person from then on. There was a presidential nominee that like strapped his dog to the top of the freaking car and then traveled across the country. I don't remember. I want to say it's Mitt Romney. Whoever it was, like, it, it sucked because I really agreed with his political leanings. But after that point, I, I just hated him. And I'm pretty sure it was Mitt Romney. But yeah, once once I hear that you had anything to do with animal abuse or anything even like akin to it, I just hate you forever. So Della Croce, fuck him. Jimmy McBratney was an Irish American gangster. He was 6'3". He weighed about 250 pounds. He was was a weightlifter, you know the type, just a big brolic dude. I pick things up, I put them down type shit like that. That's the kind of person this dude was. While he was in Greenhaven Correctional Facility for an armed robbery charge, he was described as being quiet. This is something that attracted Edward Maloney, another Irish Mafia member. Maloney said that McBratney was a good listener, and before long, the two were discussing robberies that they'd pull off as soon as they got out of jail. McBratney was an avid gun nut. He knew everything there was to know, and he wanted to become a gun collector. Let me tell you, the best way to start building your gun collection in New York, of all places, is to catch an armed robbery charge. That's that's great. That's very smart. That's okay, though, because he really didn't plan to acquire these guns legally. He regularly pulled off armed robberies, kidnappings, running guns. That's how he wanted to fund his gun collection. I feel like, though, there are certain guns that are really rare that you would have to get them legally. It's almost impossible to build a real collection if you're only able to purchase illegal guns. He also wanted to take all those earnings that he made from illegal activities and he wanted to open a nightclub. Dude had a whole lot of dreams and ambition that would never actually go anywhere. Because there is no way in hell any liquor board would give him a liquor license with his criminal record. Like, absolutely 100% would not happen. Especially when you factor in his known association with the Gambino and the Colombo crime families. No, like, absolutely not. It's a joke. A lot of people think that McBratney was the leader of a kidnapping gang, but he wasn't. He he was just a middleman. He was just like a dude in the group. I don't know why people accredit him as being the leader, but he was never a leader of anything. There was a group of Irish mafia members in a kidnapping ransom ring. Warren Sherman and John Kilcullen were in a group, and they recruited Robert Center. Center had ties to the Gambino family, and his nephew, Anthony Center, was an associate within the mafia. They also recruited Tom Thomas Genovese, who was a Colombo family associate, and he had some pretty distant common blood with Vito Genovese, the slimiest guy in the entire world. The group recruited McBratney to be a part of the kidnapping ring in October of 1972. Filippo and Ronald Miano, who were made men in the Gambino family, hired the group to kidnap a mafia member. They had some sort of beef with this dude, and they said it was a revenge plot. They also said that they wanted 10% of the ransom payment. The group kidnapped Francis. Francesco Manzo, a Lucchese family capo, at The Suite, a restaurant in Forest Hills, New York. This kidnapping went perfectly, and it was successful. Carmine Trumonti paid $150,000 for Manzo's safe return. I told you guys that I'm learning Italian, and just a fun fact, Manzo, or Manzo, means beef in Italian. So, just in case you were wondering what that name meant, it's Manzo, it's beef. 
Anyway, when the group learned that they could successfully get paid ransom payments for mafia members, they were pumped. They were like, yes, we finally found what is going to make us money. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we become millionaires. We kidnap mafia members. They pulled off two more kidnappings of members of the mafia, one of them being Emmanuel Gambino, Carlo Gambino's nephew. They attempted to kidnap a man named Junior, who some people assume is Vincent D'Amour. It's really never been confirmed who it is, but a lot of people assume it's Vincent Moore. Now, this is the fourth mafia kidnapping this group has pulled off. And the whole mafia is on high alert knowing that these kidnappings are taking place and nobody has any idea who could be next. So everybody is like, you know, looking around the corners. It's like a regular person walking around in a park when Son of Sam was out. Like these guys are, are they're on high alert. When they kidnapped Junior, shit went all the way sideways. They got him into the car after a struggle, but they had a fight amongst themselves when one of the dudes forgot to put a blindfold on him. When the leader of the group stopped the car to yell at the guy that forgot, Junior was able to escape the car and took off running. During all of this craziness, two neighborhood kids got the license plate of the truck that they were in, and they gave it to their relative who was in the mafia. They were able to run the plate, and now they knew who it was that was kidnapping everyone. On May 22nd, 1973, Mick Bratney was at Snoop's Bar and Grill in Staten Island having a drink when John Gotti, Angela Ruggiero, and Ralph Gallione came in pretending to be cops. They told him that he was under arrest and that he had to leave the bar. They said something along the lines of like, come on, you know the drill, you've done this before. And another person at the bar intervened. He was like, no, something's wrong here. Absolutely not. The scene turned chaotic and what's the best way to deal with chaos? You Cause some more chaos, of course. The entire thing went to shit already. So Galeone popped off two shots into the ceiling and ordered everybody in the bar, including the wait staff, to stand against the wall. A waitress with a real set of balls on her walked away and was able to call the cops. The three struggled to get McBratney out of the bar, so Galeone walked up and just shot him three times at close range and killed him. Because his nephew had been kidnapped, Carlo Gambino put out a contract on McBratney's head and anybody who killed him would get immediate initiation as a made member into the Gambino family. Because this all went down so publicly, all three of them were identified by witnesses. Gotti had a bad habit of like, not wearing a mask, going out in public and doing illegal things and not giving a shit if he was identified. Gotti and Ruggiero were indicted on murder charges and Gambino hired Roy Cohn to represent them. When Gallione was leaving his apartment, he was killed. Because witnesses had identified Gallione as the one that had actually pulled the trigger, Cohn was able to get Ruggiero and Gotti a deal where each of them did four years for attempted manslaughter. Now, I didn't understand why before it would be attempted manslaughter when the person actually died, but I think that they got attempted manslaughter because they didn't actually kill him. It was Galeone that killed him and now Galeone was dead. So the only thing that they did was attempted murder. They were just there. You know, they didn't kill him. Carlo Gambino died of natural causes in 1976. Paul Big Paul Castellano was appointed as the boss of the Gambino family and Della Croce was left as the underboss. When Castellano was promoted as the boss instead of Della Croce, it split the Gambino family into two factions. And each of the two factions kind of had like a passive aggressive war. Nobody died, but like like, they definitely glared at each other. When Gotti and Ruggiero got out of prison in 1976, the books were open for the first time since 1957, and both were immediately initiated as made men into the Gambino family following the murder of McBratney. Carmine Fatico was indicted on loan sharking and conspiracy charges in Suffolk County, New York. 631, represent, on May 23rd, 1972. He was again indicted in 1973 for the same thing, just a separate count in the same place. Fatico was arrested with a few members of his crew for stealing 98 mail bags and a shit ton of fur coats. These bags contained $3 million in cash and securities that had come from an Air France flight. When the case went to trial in 1976, it ended in a mistrial, but to avoid having to wait for a new trial and then go through the whole trial, Fatico copped to one count of stealing coats and was sentenced to five years in jail. Fatico was in prison 
on these charges when Gadi got out of jail and became a main member. He was given Fatiko's position as capo in charge of the Bergen crew at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, and he still had to report to Aniello De La Croce. Gadi and De La Croce were already boys, but now that he was a main member and now that he was actually a capo, they got even tighter. Gadi came to be known as De La Croce's protege, and all the mafia guys whispered about them. They'd ask Gadi where his boyfriend was whenever they saw him and make like kissy noises like Mm, where's your boyfriend Mm. as much as Gotti tried to keep his kids out of the life as usually happens his son John Gotti the third was a known associate of the family by time he hit 18 years old in December of 1978 the largest unrecoverable cash heist in history was pulled off now known as the Lufthansa heist. And your boy Gotti was a main component of the heist. Around $5.9 million in cash and $875,000 in jewelry was stolen. Jimmy Burke from the Lucchese family put it all together, but he was never charged for the crime. Burke had a lot of the people that were involved in the heist killed because he didn't want to go down for it. Parnell Stax Edwards was in charge of destroying the van after the heist. He had one job, his one job was to take the van to the junkyard in Brooklyn that Gotti owned so that Gotti could crush the truck and there would be no evidence left over. Parnell decided that going all the way to Brooklyn was like way too much work. He said, fuck it, and he went to his girlfriend's house. When he couldn't find parking, well, that was no problem either. Look, there was a wide open space in front of that fire hydrant. Two days later, the NYPD came and gave him a ticket for parking in front of a fire hydrant, but they realized that this truck fit the description of the one that had been used in the heist that everybody had been talking about. They impounded the van, and they were able to lift fingerprints from within the van to identify who had something to do with the heist. Parnell Edwards was killed for this mistake. Usually I would say like, oh my god, that's so sad. But honestly, I'm really not mad at this. Like how fucking stupid do you have to be to not only not disappear the truck, not only go to your girlfriend's house, not only park the truck in front of a fire hydrant, but to leave it there for two fucking days? Two days? Like, I feel like he was legit trying to get this truck impounded. He was trying to get everybody caught. They would have impounded it even if it wasn't involved in a heist. You can't just park a truck in front of a fire hydrant for two days. He kind of deserved to die for this shit. Like, if I was watching Power and that situation played out, I would definitely be screaming to the TV, like, just kill the guy. Like, he's so dumb. Just kill him. Like, I'm not mad. I'm not mad at it. I'm sorry. I'm not mad. Even though they had fingerprints from a bunch of different dudes that were involved, Lewis Werner was the only one that was ever actually arrested for the heist. After Gotti was initiated as a made man, he moved his family to Howard Beach. It was a modest house, but it was their house. I'm surprised it was a modest house. Gotti and his crew were De La Croce's highest earning crew with all their gambling, with their loan sharking, robbery, racketeering. They were definitely raking in the money and Gotti was nothing if not flashy and showboaty. But whatever, they got a house in Howard Beach. It was modest. One day at their Howard Beach home, Gotti's son Frank was riding his friend's minibike on the road. A drunk driver, John Favre, hit and killed him while he was riding the minibike. He was 12 years old. Police ruled this as an accident and Favre wasn't even charged. Favre started getting death threats and he went to Gotti's home with a bouquet of roses to apologize to him and his wife. Victoria came to the door with a bat and attacked him. Victoria was lost in grief. People would say that they'd see her roaming the streets late at night. She would go to baseball fields looking for Frank. It is the saddest thing I've ever heard. Like, you really can't imagine the grief that this poor woman is going through after losing her 12-year-old son to a drunk driver. It'll always be a universal law. Parents are not supposed to bury their children. They're just not. Nobody that hasn't experienced child loss can even begin to comprehend the unimaginable suffering that this poor woman is going through. So honestly, kudos to her for getting up in the morning. That's a feat on its own. If she wants to go to baseball fields, let her freaking go to baseball fields. On July 28th, 1980, Favre was seen being hit in the head and shoved into a van. He was never seen again, and his body was never found. And good for them. The FBI claims that Favre was killed and his body was dissolved in acid as payback for killing Frank. And you know what? Maybe if they had done their job and done something about it, the guy would have lived. If he was in prison, nobody could have gotten to him. But no, it was an accident. You accidentally got drunk and mowed down a 12-year-old. So yeah, I put that death 
fully on the police. Like you're out here running around trying to charge people because they're facilitating illegal gambling and stuff like that. Like that's what's important to you. Not the drunks that are sitting here and killing children on the street. No, that's not important. What's important is putting a slot machine in place so that people can gamble on it or holding a card game. Like, fuck you. Conveniently, Gotti was in Florida at the time and he already had an alibi established. He adamantly denied having any knowledge whatsoever about the attack or where Favreau was or is. According to legend, John Carneglia was the one that carried out the murder and he took Favreau's finger bones and sprinkled them in Angelo Ruggiero's soup one night when he was eating at a restaurant. Ruggiero ate the soup. Paul Castellano, working in his position as boss of the family, put out a law that no Nobody in the family was allowed to deal drugs because it brought heat onto the family. Gotti and his crew ignored this rule, obviously, because they knew better, and they just kept right on keeping on and continue dealing heroin. Ruggiero and Jean Gotti were arrested for dealing heroin. They were actually arrested after a lengthy investigation led to proof that he was dealing. The story I'm about to tell you has a lot of like personal connections, so like excuse my excitement, but the investigation was prompted after Ruggiero's brother, Salvatore Ruggiero, and his wife Stephanie were flying in a plane and their plane crashed. It killed them both instantly in Tybee Beach, Georgia. Right now I live about 40 minutes south of Tybee Beach. It's an amazing beach and I absolutely love it. But the plane had drugs on board and that prompted an investigation into Anthony Ruggiero because Anthony Ruggiero was well known as conversing with his brother. Feds put a wiretap in place in Anthony Ruggiero's home in Cedarhurst, Long Island. I had the first job I ever had in finance in Cedarhurst. It was this tiny little company that was in this like brand new industry that had never existed before. Now it's a multi-billion dollar industry and before I went in the army, I was running a company on Wall Street, so Cedarhurst will always hold a special place in my heart. Anyways, this wiretap was definitely fruitful and it led to Gene Gotti and Ruggiero being arrested for dealing heroin. Obviously, Ruggiero lied and said that he wasn't actually dealing drugs and that the feds were lying about him. He was being framed. Never me. I would never do that. Because Castellano had put out a rule that nobody was supposed to sell drugs and because Ruggiero had been arrested for doing just that, Castellano wanted the wiretap recordings, which Ruggiero had access to as soon as he went on trial. When Ruggiero absolutely refused to produce these tapes, Castellano threatened to demote Gotti if he didn't hand them over. Ruggiero obviously didn't want to produce these tapes because they proved that he was actually dealing drugs, so he wanted no part of it. He kept saying no. These wiretaps led to a whole shitstorm coming down on the Gambino family. Ruggiero was known to be a gossip. This man talked and talked and talked and talked. Everybody knew when they found out that there was a wiretap in the house that a lot of people were going to be screwed. The following year, Paul Castellano was arrested and the Mafia Commission trials started. The Mafia Commission trials were initiated after the wiretap at Ruggiero's home, heard Ruggiero talking about orders that he had received from Castellano and identifying Castellano as the boss of the family. Castellano knew that these charges were from Ruggiero and he was pissed. Even though he was mad, when he went to jail for the Mafia Commission trials, he left Gotti in place as an acting co-boss with Thomas Bellotti and Thomas Gambino. Gotti was convinced that when he got out of jail, Castellano was going to be coming after him. Secretly, I think he was just trying to protect Ruggiero. He knew Ruggiero had a big fat X on his forehead for causing the Mafia Commission trials. The Mafia Commission trials was against the ruling members of each of the five families, and taking down the bosses of the families will make everybody a little mad at you. While Gotti was acting co-boss, he ran around to the members with within the families and all of the other families as well, except the Genovese family because their boss had strong ties to Castellano and he garnered support for his plan to execute Castellano. Della Croce died from cancer in 1985. After Della Croce died, Castellano changed the hierarchy of the family. While he was in prison, he set it up so that Thomas Gambino would be the acting boss and Thomas Bellotti would be the acting underboss. So out of the three people that he had initially appointed as the group of people that were leaving the family, Gotti's the only one that was nixed in this post 
De La Croce family. Castellano had a live-in maid at his house. After members of the family visited his house, they were made aware that Castellano was having an affair with this maid. A lot of members of the family had a pretty serious problem with this. Castellano was the father of the family, and he was cheating on his wife right in front of her. And a lot of people were really, really offended by this. And the way that Sammy the Bull explains it is just when someone is the boss of the family, the entire family looks at him like like he's their father. So to see, you know, picture your father cheating on your mom, how are you going to feel about that? Now picture him doing it right in front of her. It's very offensive. It's very disrespectful. And the people in the family, they just didn't like it. Because Castellano knew the Bergen crew was responsible for his arrest, as well as that of all of the bosses of all of the families, he had plans to break up the crew and take out Ruggiero as soon as he got out of prison. Gotti knew about about Castellano's plans. Gotti is really sad and affected by Della Croce's death. He was his prodigy and they were really, really close. When they had a funeral for him, Castellano did not attend his funeral. And that was it. It was the last nail in the coffin for Gotti. Castellano didn't attend because he knew it would look really bad. The, the FBI was going to be watching that funeral like a hawk, knowing that every single mafia member would be attending. So if he attended while he was on trial saying that he wasn't actually leaving leading the mafia, no less involved in the mafia at all, it'd look really bad. It, it wouldn't be a good look. It made sense, but to an emotional and grieving Gotti, it was just a sign of disrespect, like he was spitting on Della Croce's grave. Between Castellano's refusal to attend the funeral, Gotti's demotion from Cobos, his fears that Castellano would come for him in Ruggiero, and his fear that he was going to break up the Bergen crew, who was his family, it all came together in a perfect storm. Since Gotti had already garnered some serious support from the families to take out Castellano, especially after he didn't come to the funeral, the plans were officially put into motion. Gotti and Ruggiero recruited Sammy the Bull Gravano to help them with this hit. Sammy the Bull was really good friends with Frank DiCicco, Castellano's protege, and he brought him into the plot too. Gotti didn't attend the first initial meeting where Ruggiero actually asked Sammy the Bull to be a part of the hit. DiCicco hit up Gotti and told him like we are absolutely not committing to a yes until we both speak with you alone without Ruggiero like why would you even send Ruggiero this is a pretty serious ask and you're not even going to ask us yourselves like no you're you are going to sit down alone with me and Sammy the Bull and until then you will not get a yes once they committed to be part of this, they went and asked Daniela De La Croce's permission to carry out the hit. De La Croce said, absolutely not. He's the boss. That's a golden rule. He would not give his permission. He pretty much told them like, Gotti, you're the one that did something wrong. You're the one that had a person get arrested for dealing drugs, especially after Castellano had told the family that they weren't allowed to deal drugs. Your guy is the one that got everybody arrested arrested. Your crew is the one that caused all of this. And I am absolutely not going to okay you breaking the cardinal rule. It's it's literally like the cardinal rule. Never kill a boss. And Della Croce was just absolutely not. Nope, 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 nope. Not on my watch. I will tell. I will kill you. Like, don't, don't try me. Don't try me, boy. A few months before the hit, the Chico got scared that word was going to go around that they were planning to take out Castellano. He got scared because it had been months. They had been planning it. They had sought out people to help them. And months and months later, they still hadn't done it. So DeChico and Gravano hit the mattresses at a friend's house for about two months before De La Croce passed away and their path was cleared to move forward. Castellano didn't even realize that when he didn't attend De La Croce's funeral, that De La Croce had been the sole reason that Castellano had been kept alive all this time. That without De La Croce's interference, they would have killed him months earlier. Like, the last few months of his life was a gift from De La Croce. Frank DiCicco tipped off Gotti that he'd be meeting with Castellano and some other family members on December 16th. 1985. Castellano stepped out of the limo with Thomas Bellotti in front of Sparks Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan on the night of the 16th. Four assassins were dressed in trench coats and Russian fur hats. Gotti and Gravano sat in a car across the street with walkie-talkies. 
communicating with the shooters to let them know that Castellano's limo was coming in. And also they were there to come in afterwards and kind of verify that Belodi and Castellano were actually dead. They were also there as backup shooters and they were planning to engage in a shoot off with any cops or anybody that stepped in the way of the shooters being able to get out of there after the attack. The hit was said to be organized like a military operation. It took place on the busy streets of Manhattan around Christmas time. So if you've ever been to Manhattan around Christmas time, it's crazy. There's so many people everywhere, everywhere. Like you can barely walk down the sidewalk. There's so many people. All four shooters escaped. Nobody got caught. That's absolutely crazy. Like there's millions of people everywhere. They walk up and shoot someone and kill two people on the road with thousands of people on the road and they all got away. Nobody got caught. DeChico was seated inside the restaurant with four other men in the Gambino family waiting for Castellano to arrive. He had a gun and he threatened the other men that if they got up to interfere with what was going on in the street, he would kill them. This was the first assassination of a New York City mob boss since 1957 when Albert Anastasia was killed in a barber shop. It didn't happen again until 2019 when Frank Cali was killed at his Staten Island home. And that wasn't even an assassination. That was just some crazy dude. Gotti, Gallo, and DeChico were named as a committee to run the family while a new boss was being elected. The family said an internal investigation was going to be taking place to figure out who killed Castellano, but that was an absolute joke because everybody, I'm talking even the public, knew that Gotti killed him. Like, there was no investigation needed. Anybody could tell you who did it. But they had to save face. They couldn't really just make it look like, you know, their boss was killed and they were just like, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, that's great. (laughs) <laughs> On January 15th, 1986, 20 capos held a meeting and Gotti was voted in as the new boss of the Gambino family. DeChico was officially named as the underboss. Even though I haven't heard this, I feel like Gotti probably promised DeChico to make him an underboss as payment for tipping him off as to where Castellano would be so that they could execute the hit and for his part in the assassination. DeChico was Castellano's protege. He had to give him something good for being involved in this. Like that that's no small feat. That's a pretty big thing for him to do. On April 13th, 1986, DeChico was in Diker Heights in Brooklyn visiting James Baella, a Castellano loyalist. Victor Amuso and Anthony Casso from the Lucchese family planted a bomb in DeChico's car, killing him immediately. Gotti was supposed to join DeChico on the visit to Diker Heights, but he backed out at the very last second. The soldier that did join DeChico apparently looked a lot like Gotti because when they detonated the car bomb, they killed the Chico and they killed the other soldier that was with him, but they were under the impression that they had taken both of them out. Now, obviously, this attack was in retribution for the attack on Castellano. Anthony Gaspipe Casso was the former underboss of the Lucchese crime family. He was regarded as a homicidal maniac and is suspected of committing dozens of murders. He confessed to his involvement in somewhere between 15 to 36 murders. Anthony Achitoro, a former capo in the Jersey crew, once said that all he wanted to do is kill, 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 get what you can, even if you didn't earn it. Caso confessed to the murders of Frank DeChico, Roy Tomeo, and Vladimir Reznikov, as well as several attempts on Gotti's life. Even though he flipped, he didn't do well in Witsec, and he was kicked out of the program. He was later sentenced to 455 years in prison for racketeering, extortion, and murder. He died of COVID on December 15th, 2020. At the time that Gotti took control, the Gambino family had 23 active crews, had about 300 made men, 2,000 associates, and they grossed about $500 million a year. Gotti declared $100,000 a year to the IRS, and he said that he earned that as a plumbing supply salesman. But he brought home about $10 million a year in cash. The job that he claimed to have as a salesman was for a company owned by a boyhood friend, Anthony Garino. Garino gave Gotti the no-show job after he was required to have gainful employment after he got parole. Gotti had an office for this position at the Bergen Club. The FBI tailed Gotti constantly. A few times at a restaurant, he would send over a bottle to Stephen Morell, the FBI agent that was following him around at the time. Every single time, Morell sent it back. Once, when Gotti put down an $8,000 bet on a horse 
at the Meadowlands Harness Racetrack in Jersey, Muriel put some money down on that same horse. It was a lot less, but he assumed that if Gotti put down that amount of money, he had to have something going. The race had to be fixed. There was some way he had to guarantee that win. When the horse came in dead last, Morel told Gotti, you're ruining me, John. You know I'm a degenerate gambler. The public was very aware that Gotti killed Castellano and took his position as the boss of the Gambino family. It wasn't a secret. Everybody knew. Gotti quickly became a household name. He was called the Dapper Don because of his expensive taste in suits. He banned any members from taking any plea bargains that acknowledged whatsoever the existence of the mafia, of the family, of their involvement in the mafia, just anything that had anything to do with the mafia, you were absolutely not allowed to accept in court. The public began to absolutely love Gotti. He was really good at public relations. He gave off a very charismatic personality to the media. They legit idolized this man. The mafia was also well known to protect the neighborhood that they operated within. Gotti came off as this, you know, family man that the people love. And the people that lived in the neighborhood where the mafia operated, they really enjoyed the perks of not having to worry about their homes or businesses, especially when crime was at an all-time high in New York. You knew better than to go on the subway at night. Like, there, this was not a safe neighborhood. But Gotti and the mafia, they made sure that it was a safe neighborhood wherever they operated. So people liked him. He also threw a crazy 4th of July block party every year. There would be food, music, fireworks. The entire neighborhood was invited. And homes and businesses, they didn't need to worry about being robbed because they knew that to rob somebody during this was to go up against the Gambino family. And and trust me, they did not want that smoke. No matter how far up the ladder Gotti went, he always maintained a relationship with the people and businesses in the area. You would see him hanging out outside the Ravenite Social Club. He would give kids money to go get ice cream from the ice cream truck. He'd remember your name, ask how your wife was. So he was an integral part of the neighborhood, and people really liked that about him as well. He also had this perception that he could beat the government. It seemed like no matter how many times they came for him, and no matter or how hard they tried, they just could absolutely not touch him. All of this, plus the fact that Gotti came from absolutely nothing. He like literally picked himself up from his bootstraps. His family was dirt poor. He didn't have an infamous father or any famous relative. So he literally did this all on his own. And that really made Gotti an idol to the working class Americans. He was charged with assault and robbery of a refrigerator mechanic named Ramal Paella. Before the trial, Gambino family members had severed his brake lines, they'd made threatening phone calls, they'd stalked this man, they just tortured him. When he first reported the crime, he had absolutely no idea who it was that had attacked him. When Paella took the stand, he said that he did not remember who it was that attacked him. He didn't remember anything about the attack. What attack? I don't even remember being attacked. The day after Ramal Paella's testimony, the New York Post's front page read, I forgot he. He was charged with racketeering, but the judge rescheduled the trial because of how focused the media was on the first trial. And honestly, it probably tainted it in his favor. Everyone in America knew what this man did, who he was. Everyone knew he was a criminal and very, very few people wanted to see him go to jail, even though he was a criminal. Everybody loved him. While the judge did reschedule his trial, he also revoked his bail because of the claims of witness tampering from the first trial. While he was in jail, Gotti ordered Ruggiero and Sammy the Bull Gravano to kill Robert DiBernardo. Robert DiBernardo was a Gambino family member. He controlled a lot of commercial pornography in the U.S. His well-known link to the mafia deterred competitors or any other criminals from ever getting any ideas about coming up against him or his business. DiBernardo didn't keep a crew or anything. He was completely independent. He was a lone wolf. He didn't have any interest whatsoever in like rising through the ranks of the Gambino family or the mafia in general. He just wanted to be successful and make some friends along the way. When Gotti was in prison, Angelo Ruggiero was the only one that was allowed to visit him. Ruggiero went to Sammy the Bulgavano and told him that Gotti wanted him to kill Robert DiBernardo. According to Gravano, he wasn't really sure about that. He knew DiBernardo didn't maintain a crew or like really have any of the 
elements that were necessary to carry out a power play. From what he knew about Robert DiBernardo, he really didn't have any interest in a power play either. He was the consigliere, though, and he did what the boss of the family told him to do. On June 5th, 1986, he lured DiBernardo to the basement of his drywall business in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Gravano told Joseph Old Man Peruta to get DiBernardo a cup of coffee. Peruta got up and shot DiBernardo in the back of the head. Gravano took over DiBernardo's control of the Teamsters Local 282 chapter to run alongside his construction racket. Gravano later learned that Gotti had actually never ordered the hit. Ruggiero said that it was Gotti that ordered it, and Ruggiero did that because he was upset that Di Bernardo had told him that he wasn't smart enough to be underboss. At the time, Ruggiero was on trial for the heroin charge, and if he wasn't on trial, then he was going to be the underboss instead of Frank DiCicco when Gotti became the boss. Ruggiero was actually also remanded to jail because when he went to court one day, he was acting an absolute fool in the courtroom. He was talking shit to the prosecution, so the judge was like, I bet you want to act like a fool? I'll treat your ass like a fool. Enjoy sitting in prison, motherfucker. Since the Chico was dead and Ruggiero was in prison, Gotti named Joseph Shorty Armon as his underboss. Trial resumed in August of 1986 with Willie, Willie Boy Johnson, who had since turned government witness. For this trial, there was a juror that had a dirty little secret. Juror number 11, George Pape, had a secret friendship with Bosco Radonjic who was the leader of the Westies, an Irish-American crew who was affiliated with the Gambino family. The juror hit up Bosco and was like, Ayo, bro, what's up? Long time, no speak. So, uh, so I, boom, check it. My vote on this trial for your friend? Yeah, it's for sale for the right price. The Westies are an Irish-American crew who were affiliated with the Gambino family. They operated in Hell's Kitchen, running rackets, drug trafficking, and doing contract killings. In the days after Murder, Inc., they kind of took that space that was left wide open when Murder, Inc. closed down. They were founded in the mid-1960s and only had between 12 and 26 members at the time. It kind of depended on like who was in jail at the time and who was out. The gang, all together with that little amount of members, was responsible for about 60 to 100 murders between 1968 and 1986, which really confused the shit out of my dyslexic ass. I, 1968 and 1986, it took me a lot to get there. <laughs> the Westies went to war with the Italians around the 1970s because the Genovese family wanted to take control over the Jacob Javin Center that was going to be built soon in Hell's Kitchen. Mickey Spillane was the leader and he refused to allow absolutely any involvement by the Italians. Even though the Italians had way more people than the Irish, the Irish were successful in keeping them away from the Javits Center. When the Italians got mad, they hired Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan to assassinate Tom DeBaney, Eddie the Butcher Comiskey, and Tom the Greek Capados, three of Spillane's top lieutenants. Spillane was killed by Roy DeMeo in 1977. Jimmy Coonan hired DeMeo to kill Spillane so that he could take control of the Westies, and DeMeo could do business with Coonan instead of being locked out the way that they were while Spillane was running shit. There's like a whole drama that goes on in this, and I might do that in a later video, but honestly, it really had nothing to do with Gotti, so that's a story for a different time. But it's it's a whole shit show. If you're interested, go look into the Westies versus the Italian War. There's a lot to it. Sammy the Bull Gravano paid Pape $60,000 to guarantee a hung jury. So going into this trial, Gotti knew the absolute worst case scenario was a hung jury. Obviously, the best case scenario is a not guilty verdict, but there was absolutely zero chance of being found guilty. If you watch Sammy the Bull's podcast, which I do because like, yeah, fuck him. But dude is a superb storyteller. And if he wasn't a rat, he'd be my friggin' idol. But yeah, if you watch his podcast, he talks about how Gotti was walking around like all arrogant and smiling and shit and like all showboaty and everything. And he was acting that way because Gravano had passed it along on a note. He had drawn a noose on it, indicating that he had secured a hung jury. So of course, Gotti's walking around without a care in the world because he knows for a fact he's not going to jail, at least not right now. Gotti was acquitted of all charges, so it came out to be the best case scenario. Both of these charges are for things that happened before he became boss, but the trial happened after he had become boss. Because he was seemingly untouchable by the government, he got a new nickname in the press, the Teflon Don. Because as much as the government threw at him, they couldn't make anything stick to him like Teflon. 
Five years after Gotti was acquitted, Pape was found guilty of obstruction of justice. He was sentenced to three years in prison. Gotti's underboss and consigliere were convicted of racketeering in 1987 and both went to jail. Ruggiero and Jean Gotti were on trial for heroin charges, and Ruggiero was remanded, so he was also in jail. Gravano took Gallo's place as consigliere. Gotti started making all the capos in the Cambino family come to the Ravenite Social Club every week and update him on family affairs, income, every Thing. And this caused a huge problem because a lot of these guys, they flew under the radar and nobody ever knew that they were affiliated. Because they had to start coming to the Ravenite Social Club, people that the FBI never even knew were involved in the mafia, they were able to identify a lot of them. The FBI also placed an agent, Bruce Mao, into the family as an undercover agent. He was able to get a whole bunch of conversations on wire. These wires confirmed Gotti as the head of the family. In 1980, Gotti, Vincent the Chin Gigante, who was the head of the Genovese family, and Victor Amuso, the Deadly Don, and the head of the Lucchese family, attended the first commission meeting since the Mafia Commission trials. This meeting took place to avoid a war in the families. The FBI came to Gotti and told him that they had heard the Lucchese family consigliere discussing a hit that they were planning to carry out against him. Victor Little Vic Arono also joined the commission as the head of the Colombo family, but Joseph Messino, the Bonanno family head, was denied because he was too close to Gotti and the other bosses felt like Messino being in the commission was pretty much just giving Gotti a second vote. That's okay though because Messino would later become the first ever boss of one of the five families to turn government witness. On December 24th, 1988, John Gotti III was initiated as a made man by Sammy the Bull Gravano. He quickly became a capo. Sammy the Bull Gravano, he initiated him because he wanted to avoid claims of nepotism. So if John Gotti did it himself, it would have looked really bad. So he just had Gravano do it. In January 1989, Gotti was arrested outside the Ravenite Social Club for ordering a hit on John O'Connor by the Westies. John had vandalized a family-owned restaurant because they didn't use labor unions, which is kind of surprising because you usually see the mafia running the labor unions. So you would think that they would use the labor unions that they ran in their business. But for some reason, this This one business was not using labor unions, so O'Connor vandalized the restaurant and Gotti had him killed for it. He put Sammy the Bull in place as his underboss so that if he went to jail, Sammy would be the acting boss of the family. He was kind of just lining things up just in case if he ever got arrested or went to jail. Gotti was acquitted of all charges. Again, keeping his status as the Teflon down intact. When he was found not guilty, people took to the streets to celebrate and they lit off fireworks over Brooklyn. It was a RT. The FBI tried to tap the Ravenite Social Club, but really they didn't ever have any luck. They tapped the main room, but they never picked up anything of interest. They tapped every part of that club and they never had any luck. And, and they're absolutely lost because they're like, this dude is such a talker. We know he's saying something. Some shit that will put him away for the rest of his life. What the hell is going on? Why are we not catching anything? An informant told the FBI that the reason that their bug wasn't working was because they used the apartment upstairs that belonged to a widow of a former mafia member to discuss all of the official business. Once they found that out, they tapped the widow's apartment. Gotti was caught on tape confirming his position as the boss of the family, and he was talking about the murder of multiple family members, and he was discussing plans to murder Louis DeBono. Usually when the FBI hears people talking on a wiretap about their plans to kill someone, they'll inform the person that's about to be killed so that they can protect themselves. They had let Gotti know in the past that the Lucchese consigliere was planning to kill him and they always did this because they couldn't they couldn't just let someone get killed. They like they couldn't have that on their conscience especially like when that person dies what are they going to say? Like oh yeah we knew it was going to happen but we didn't want to interfere. Like no you are police. You have to do something. So they always let someone know when they heard that someone was about to be killed. In this case the FBI misheard the conversation and they thought it was someone else that they were talking about. They informed the wrong person that there was a plan to have them killed, and that left DeBono without a tip, and he did end up being killed. Ten months later, on December 11th, 
11, 1990, the Raven Night Social Club was raided and Gotti, Gravano, and Frank Lacasio were arrested. Gotti was charged with five murders, Castellano being one of them. Conspiracy to murder, loan sharking, illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, bribery, tax evasion, everything you would expect to see in a mafia member arrest you're going to see here. And that's a huge reason why these bosses do everything in their power to avoid being officially confirmed as the boss of the family. As soon as the FBI can prove that you're the boss, all of the illegal activities that anybody in the family carries out can come back on you. Oh, a street soldier you never met killed someone? Well, since you're the boss of the family, you're responsible for that. The orders were given by you, and you could have stopped it if you wanted to. Even if they didn't directly give that order, they gave the order that that soldier could work in the family. It's kind of like if you own a company, but you have a CFO that's in charge of the books and that CFO falsifies them. You're responsible for that and you'll have to pay the restitution and you'll go down for tax evasion, even if you never even saw the books. It's his job, but it's your company and you're the one that's responsible for it. You signed off on it, even if you had no idea what was going on in the books. And that's why it's such a huge deal that you either learn how to do your books or you find an accountant that you really, really trust if you ever have a company that's earning a lot of money. If you've never heard about Enron, here's some homework, go check that out. There were literally men jumping out of the buildings over that shit and they had no clue that this was going on before it all went down. A lot of these charges probably weren't even Gotti. They were people that were operating below him with his signature. The feds getting him on tape confirming that he's the boss of the family is exactly what they needed and as soon as they got it, they were able to arrest them. At the pretrial hearing, the prosecution played the tapes from the widow's apartment, so the entire group knew how absolutely screwed they were. All three were denied bail. Cutler and Gerald Shargel were named as part of the evidence. They were the lawyers that always represented Gotti and the people within the family. They were deemed as Gambino in-house counsel, which they were, but to take someone's lawyers away, that's, that's a serious move. Gotti hired Albert Krieger, who had represented Joseph Bonanno in the past. Bonanno Bonanno, we know, was never found guilty of anything during his time in the family. He was found guilty of shit later on, but that was afterwards when he was living in Arizona. People like Krieger made sure that even though he was the boss of the family, he never got touched by the law. On these tapes, Gotti is talking all kinds of smack about Gravano. He said he was too greedy, and he talked about how he was going to set up Gravano to take the fall for all five of these murders. Little did they know at the time, Gotti also went to Gravano in person and told him that he'd be taking the fall. So even if Gravano didn't believe the tapes, he knew Gotti was flipping on him. This led to Gravano flipping and turning government informant. He was one of the highest ranking mafia members in the history of the mafia to turn government informant. And he still is to this day. See, this is where the waters get a little murky for me. Yeah, Sammy the Bull Gravano is a rat. He is. He lost all respect in that moment. But is he though? Isn't John Gotti telling him that he's going to put him in jail for the rest of his life just as bad as Gravano testifying and putting him in jail for the rest of his life? Now, don't get me wrong. Gravano didn't only testify against Gotti. He took the entire mafia down with him and he testified at a shit ton of hearings. He literally took the stand on people he did like small gambling jobs with. That is an absolute rat. But what do you think? Tell me what you think. Because if he wouldn't have done that, if he would have only testified testified against Gotti. Is he a rat? Was he wrong? Should he have let Gotti put it all on him and spent the rest of his life in prison so that Gotti could go on leading the family? I don't know. This one isn't like so cut and dry for me. I don't know the answer. Because I gotta say, if someone was telling me that they were gonna work so that I went to jail for the rest of my life for them and their crimes, they'd immediately become my enemy. And I wouldn't really care about putting them in jail for the rest of theirs. I probably wouldn't become a government informant, but I would damn sure make sure that that man at least spent the rest of his life in prison with me. Gotti later attempted to reconcile with Gravano, but he wasn't able to. Tell me you're going to make sure I go to jail for the rest of my life so that you can skate? And let's see if we'll be friends afterwards. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Gravano knew that Gotti would be working against him, but he also knew that he had lost Shargle, the lawyer that had always represented him and kept him out of prison in the past. He was almost certain that he was going to jail for the rest of his life if he didn't do anything. Gotti and Lacasio were tried with an anonymous 
jury so nobody in the family could find out who was on the jury and either threaten them or pay them off. The jury was, for the first time in Brooklyn history, fully sequestered. Which I feel is a power move for the prosecution. Like, yeah, I get it. You don't want the jury to be at risk. You don't want it to be tampered with. Especially with someone that has a history of paying off or terrorizing jury members. I get that. But at the end of the day, I feel like you're almost certain to get a guilty verdict from a sequestered jury. If you take me away from my friends and family, put me in a goddamn hotel room, with no TV, no cell phone, no way of communicating with anybody for months and months. See how quick I am to say guilty, to get the fuck out of there and go home. There is going to be no jury deliberating for a month to make a decision if they're not going home at the end of the day. These are regular people with regular jobs and lives that you're taking away. I don't blame them for making whatever decision gets them out of there as fast as possible. Andrew Maloney and John Gleason were the prosecutors. They played tapes of Gotti discussing family business, including murders that he had approved and talking about how bad things had gotten between him and Castellano, which established a motive for Gotti to kill him. An eyewitness identified Carneglia as Belodi's shooter. Carneglia wasn't on trial, so that really didn't have any impact on him, which is wild that they literally had somebody that stood there and watched this man kill someone and they still still didn't put Carneglia on trial. That's wild. But the fact that any jury would have found Carneglia guilty means that Gotti was guilty because Carneglia was a Gambino family member and Gotti was the head of the Gambino family. So that means two things. That means that Gotti is responsible for it because it was carried out by a Gambino family member. That also means that it's very likely that Gotti ordered the hit himself since somebody within his family carried it out. Gravano started to testify he can confirmed that Gotti was the boss of the Gambino family, and he confirmed everything that was heard on the tapes. He confessed to 19 murders, 10 of them implicating Gotti. He also discussed the murder and aftermath of Castellano's murder. Lacasio's lawyer asked Gravano, and you know, in order to please your new masters, you would do anything you have to do, say anything you have to say. Isn't that true? The judge obviously sustained the prosecution's objection to that. Gravano continuously insisted that he was just trying to turn his life around, and that's why he was testifying. I might err on the side of believing him if he didn't testify so many times on so many other trials. This man literally took the stand against anyone and everyone in the mafia. If you ever lent him $20, he was taking the stand against you to put you in jail, so fuck him. And that actually really hurts to say, because as I said, I watched his podcast and that man is a really genius storyteller. Like, I want to like him. I want to. I want to idolize him. And if he had put away just Gotti, I probably would. Honestly, I probably would. But with 19 murders confessed, honestly, if he didn't do that, he'd be in jail. He only skated because he testified so many times against so many other people. But for him to come out and act like he's still a gangster, like, nah, bro. No, you're not. No, you're not. Mm Mm-mm. You lost that. Nope. He mentioned this girl that I used to know when I was a kid on one of his podcasts. I was like, oh shit, I know that girl. And I hit her up. She was like, yeah, he was a family friend. He used to come around when I was a kid. Honestly, though, like as a kid, you really don't know anything about any of these guys in the mafia. You just know that, you know, they're tough guys, I guess. I don't know. You really don't know anything. You just know like they're an adult that's around. They're nice to kids. So, I mean, I had mafia members holding guns to my parents' heads when I was like five in front of me. But, you know, they were family, so whatever. (laughs) As Gravano left the witness stand, Gotti mockingly wiped imaginary tears from his eyes. Court was adjourned after a fire alarm was sounded in the courthouse. Turned out to be a false alarm. I wonder what happened there. Five of the six witnesses called to take the stand for Gotti were ruled irrelevant or extraneous. The only person that was left to testify on Gotti's behalf was his tax attorney, Murray Appleman. The defense attempted to have a mistrial ruled thanks to the closing arguments from Maloney, but it was overruled. Throughout the trial, Gotti was said to have become increasingly hostile, calling Gravano a junkie and 
claiming that the dismissal of a juror was the same thing as the fixing of the 1919 World Series, which we all know was attributed to Arnold Rothstein, Lucky Luciano's mentor. On April 2nd, 1992, after only 14 hours of deliberation, see, I told you, I told you there would be no time lost on deliberation, I told you. Gotti was found guilty on all charges. Locasio was found guilty on all but one. When Jamie Foxx, the ADIC of the FBI's New York field office, held a press conference, he said, The Teflon is gone. The Don is covered in Velcro and all charges stuck. On June 23rd, 1992, Gotti and Locasio were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and they were each fined $250,000. He self-surrendered to begin his sentence on December 14th, 1992. He was at the U.S. Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. He spent almost his entire sentence in solitary confinement, being allowed out of his cell for only about an hour a day. His final appeal was rejected in 1994. A fellow prisoner, Walter Johnson, not to be confused with Lily Johnson, Walter Johnson, punched him in the face after Gotti called him a racial slur. Gotti offered the Aryan Brotherhood. It's a huge gap, but he offered them somewhere between forty and $400,000 to have him killed. But Johnson was moved to a supermax prison, so nobody was ever able to get their hands on him. Gotti was charged with murder, attempted murder, and racketeering inside prison, along with like 50 other dudes. Like they, a lot of people got charged in this little sting. He remained the boss of the Gambino family. His brother, Peter, and later on his son, John III, were acting bosses until he died and Peter became the official boss of the family. John Gotti... The third was indicted and pled guilty of racketeering in 1998. After he got a six-year sentence, he claims to have completely left the life. Victoria, his mother, she didn't know that he was involved in the mafia at all whatsoever until he got this six-year sentence. And Victoria threatened Gotti that if he didn't allow him to leave the life with absolutely no harm done to him, she would divorce him, leave him, stop putting money in his commissary, and stop showing up for visits. I remember when this all happened. It was a it was a big deal. It was all over the news showing Gotti talking shit to his son for pleading out of the charge. He said he should have taken it like a man. He used to be on the news all the time talking shit to like his young kids or his grandkids for getting bullied, getting bad grades. He was just out of his goddamn mind. He used to like say really mean things to these little kids. It was very weird. It absolutely killed almost every American to watch this go down. Every time he would come on TV, my mom would be like, oh, this breaks my heart. He doesn't belong in prison. In 1998, Gotti was diagnosed with throat cancer. He was sent to the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. He had surgery and the tumor was removed, but the cancer returned two years later. So he returned to the Federal Prisoners Hospital and he spent the rest of his life there. Gotti died on June 10, 2002 at 61 years old in the Federal Prisoners Hospital. The Roman Catholic Diocese said that Gotti's family could not have a requiem mass for him. I mentioned this in my Joe Ad Donna's video, the church never allows mafia members to have a mass at the church. So it was super surprising when they did allow Adonis's family to have a mass there. Gotti and almost every mafia member before him and after him was denied. They did allow the family to have a mass after the burial, though. Victoria had his funeral at a non-church facility, and about 300 onlookers followed the procession, which passed by the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club on its way to the ceremony, where he was entombed in the crypt next to his son Frank. By the time Gotti died, half of the made men in the families were in prison. The families blamed Gotti for that. I'm thinking because Sammy the Bull Gravano put a lot of those guys away and Sammy the Bull was Gotti's consigliere or because Gotti just, he was very media driven. He was all over the news and he lived his life in a very public manner and the mafia guys didn't like that. It was a very bad thing for them. Everybody always tried to fly under the radar and here Gotti is giving interviews and being seen all over TV and being covered on the news constantly. And everybody knew that was going to lead to trouble and it did. And he took everybody down with him. So the families were mad at him. Even though he was still the boss of the Gambino family when he died, 
none of the five families sent representatives to the funeral. I'm sure that the feds were absolutely drooling over Gotti's funeral, praying to get some good footage of some mafia members, and not one of them showed up. Mafia funerals are sacred. No matter what he did, I'm, I'm really surprised that nobody came to his funeral. That's, that's wild. Sammy the Bull Gravano was released from prison in 1994. He had plastic surgery on his face so that he could enter WITSEF. He moved to Tempe, Arizona, and he started a swimming pool company. He got tired of that pretty quickly. He didn't like the constraints of WITSEC, and he left the program and moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. He started living a public life under his own name, conducting radio, magazine, and TV interviews. I also remember this, and it was absolutely crazy to watch this go down. He got on the radio and he was like, yo, yo, this is Sammy G, baby, I'm out here, come see me. I was like, oh shit, this man really is a gangster, like, for real, this man is out here shouting from the rooftops for the entire mafia to come find him, like, he has no fear whatsoever. But that's also probably because he made sure that anybody worth anything went to jail, so what does he have to be scared of now? He wrote a book about his life, but New York State and the families of his victims took legal action and claimed the profits from his book, so he didn't see anything from that. The Gambinos put out a hit on him, and Thomas Gotti sent two men to Arizona to kill him in 1999, but in February of 2000, he was arrested with his wife and two children and 40 other people for operating an ecstasy ring in Arizona. In the ring, he was profiting about $500,000 a week, and in an ironic turn, his family was implicated by informants. He was charged on both the state and the federal level, and he got 20 years for this. His son Gerald got nine years and his wife and daughter got several years on probation each. In 2003, Sammy and his daughter Karen were ordered to pay $803,000 in court costs for the investigation. So he literally had to pay the FBI to investigate him. He was released from prison in December of 2020, and now he has a pretty successful podcast. Angelo Ruggiero developed terminal lung cancer in 1989. Gotti wanted to order a hit out on him for letting himself be heard on the wiretap talking about him. But according to Gravano, he was able to talk him out of it because Ruggiero was dying of cancer anyway. So what was the point? Gotti stripped him of his rank, severed all ties with him, and didn't sit with him at all while he was dying. It's funny that he was willing to kill Paul Castellano for wanting Ruggiero dead when he was caught on tape talking about him. But as soon as it was Gotti that he was talking about on tapes, well, now he needs to die. It was okay then, but now that it's me, now you're dead. Ruggiero died of lung cancer in 1989. Ravano said that he literally had to drag him to the funeral. His son, Angelo Ruggiero Jr., was convicted of grand larceny in 1998. He got one to three years in prison, and then he got an additional three years for intimidation of Timothy Angeli, who was supposed to testify against another Gambino family member in Brooklyn in 2009. Gene Gotti and John Carneglia were convicted of drug charges and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Victoria Gotti has dealt with some serious health issues since Gotti died, including having a stroke. She's okay now, though, and living her best life out there. Her wealth is estimated at $2 million, even though Gotti's wealth was estimated at $30 million when he died. John Gotti III was boss of the family for a while, but he got out when he got his cute little six-year sentence. He's so cute. He wrote a book, and he worked with the director on the movie of Gotti. And he turned out like a shit ton of acting jobs that he had been offered. I'm guessing they were trying to turn him into like the next Al Pacino or Robert De Niro, but he wasn't interested. So he said no. He now lives on Long Island with his wife and six children. Victoria, his sister, also lives on Long Island. My dad sees her at the doctor all the time, so I know for a fact she still lives there. <laughs> Victoria Gotti, Gotti's daughter, not his wife, his daughter, has been the most visible of his kids. She participated in the reality shows Growing Up Gotti, Real Housewives of New Jersey, and Mob Wives. She wasn't on Mob Wives for that long. I remember she only did a few episodes, if that many, maybe one. I don't really know. I watched Mob Wives. I know she did. She didn't have a huge role in that. She wrote several books. One of them I read. It was really good. I was hoping for more info about Gotti and there really wasn't that much. It was really all about her health problems, but it was a good book, so can't complain. She also has an auto repair shop that all of her sons work at. The shop was raided along with her family home in 2016. They didn't find anything and they couldn't arrest anyone, so go Victoria. That's all I have for the man, the myth, the legend, 
John Gotti. Thanks so much if you made it to this point. Again, I know this was a super long one, but there was just a lot of information to pack in. Hopefully you guys found it entertaining and educational if that's what you came for. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, comment, do all the things. Bye.